Today I will talk about increasing the efficiency of workflows uh, on the use cases in the life sciences, some research we have done in, in the last year. And only sh shortly because most of the people are not familiar where the University of Notre Dame is, or they assume it's in France. There's one in France, but I'm in, on, it's the one in, in the US, and it's really in the middle of nowhere, of northern Indiana. But I, one and a half hours from Chicago, that um, rescues it a little bit. Um, we have four undergraduate colleges and about 35 research institutes and centers about 12,000 students so and on the pictures you see the straight to the main building street to the main building so it's a beautiful campus and you see, see the stadium or football stadium so Notre Dame is in the US very famous for the fighting Irish our football team so I work for the Center for Research Computing besides being a research assistant professor and we do software development and profiling especially the science and especially involved with science gateways development and so the computational scientist support means that we do a lot of collaborative research and grant development on campus with different departments from computer science to life sciences to architecture to humanities and uh, the department does also system administration and prototype architectures. So in HPC, for example, with OpenStack and cloud computing, we have about um, 25,000 cores, more than 25,000 cores we offer to faculty on campus and um, three petabyte of storage. We also have access to national resources, offer the access to exceed or to OSG or Blue Waters. And all in all, we are in the department about 40 researchers, research programmers and HPC specialists to give a short overview. So on the right hand side, you see on the top our department and below that our HPC center, which is pretty cool with the old Union Station, which is really also nice on the inside. The life sciences, I mean, a lot of people heard about life sciences in different areas, genomics, proteomics. So I like always this example with, with the butterfly. So they have the same genes, but they have different pro proteins. So the difference between larvae and butterfly and the appearance is quite different as we know. So to study these processes of metabolomics, immunomics, um, system bio biology, I would talk a little bit about molecular simulations because we have a project in molecular simulation and I would count docking in this regard also to to life sciences and molecular simulations only to make it easier I know that the computational chemists are sometimes a little bit um, not so happy with me that I count that to life sciences but computational chemistry is, let's say, in my explanation, also part of life sciences. Um, we have epidemiology, we have a quite big department also at Notre Dame there. So life sciences has really a wide field. And in 2001, we had this genomics boom. And in one year, in 2001, only one day apart from each other, the human genome was published in, in science and in nature from different two different teams. One was the biotech company Celera, the other one the Human Genome Project, and of course they were different. So the leaders of the project were not so happy as they look like on, on this picture, but they really had to, yeah, so I, they had to convince each other that they have to smile at each other. So, so that was, was a big start for genomics and for life sciences and computational life sciences in general. So and of course, big data and life sciences belong together. So there's really an explosion in the quantity and the variety and complexity of data. And we can, you know, answer questions nowadays. We couldn't even maybe ask about 10 years ago because we have all these different possibilities. And if you look on the left hand side, there's a minion that's a really small sequencing machine it doesn't have the same possibility like the sequencing machine in the middle but it, 
to show that already in this size you can really get reasonable results for different sequences, that, that's fantastic. That would have nobody really assumed 10 years ago. And the costs are far reduced. So the Human Genome Project still needed about, you know, $2 billion. And nowadays you need three days and thousand dollars to, to get a genome sequenced. And also NIH has shown that really the cost per genome was so far reduced, if you see it in this graphic, the comparison to Moore's law. So we, we have really this big amount of data and we want to analyze it. it. Data is not worth it if you cannot analyze it, if you only have it playing around. So what you need is to use different tools in different steps and the sequence of connective steps in a defined order based on their control and data dependencies uh, is, is a workflow. And what we need are workflow engines and systems. In the last decade, a lot of really mature workflow systems have been developed and further developed and also optimized for HPC. And they have different workflow concepts. So they may, might be data driven, they might be process driven. Different workflow languages from XML dialects to JSON to scripting languages. And they support different workflow constructs. So some are direct acyclic graphs. Some can are able of uh, working with loops. And some of them might be also familiar to you or some of you, like Workways, which is developed in David's group, which is based on Kepler or Pegasus. I will talk a little bit about GUs and Galaxy. And there are also workflow editors, because the scientists, partly they want to develop their own workflows. They know exactly which kind of steps they need to do, or they want to use reconfigured, pre-configured ones. And there are different technologies for that. There are workbenches or web-based ones. And they have a different look and feel. The three examples I uh, show here, on the left-hand side, you see WSP grade above of three use. Then in the middle is nine. And on the right-hand side is Galaxy. And this is a VAT winning solution. So that's the one in Australia, also maybe one or a couple of you know, with a genomics virtual lab, which gives you your own Galaxy workflow engine. So the state of the art is that we have data and compute intensive problems. And we have a lot of web-based Argyle frameworks, which can use can be used by, by users and by developers to make a really nice interface as a web-based solution. We have distributed data and computing infrastructures. We have the high-speed network. And the tools and workflow engines are there. So, so users, uh, all around the users, all these possibilities are there. But they are generally, in the life sciences, not IT specialists. And they don't have to be. They're, they are domain researchers, they're, they're in the vet lab. And um, so to make them really happy, there's a need for intuitive and efficient workflows. So to make a little bit sad scientist to a happy scientist. And um, one of the really big part of um, usability is, I like this, this citation from the book, don't make me think. Even the title is already nice. And um, so Steve Coop said, after all usability really just means that making something, no, I cannot read that. Making sure that something works well, that a person can use something, whether it's a website, a fighter jet, or a revolving door for its intended purpose without getting hopelessly frustrated. And the other thing I found on Facebook that it's also nice. So usability, yeah, it's like, the user interface is like a joke. If you have to explain it, it's not that good. So I totally agree to that. So that, that's the goal with usability in workflow editors. And the other thing, ah, ah. And efficiency, with efficiency in workflows, of course, we want to save time. That's one of the overall goals. 
that the researcher can get his results, her results as fast as possible. And also under yeah, the least amount of computational resources, then we can do it. And uh, which is also, of course, especially in cloud infrastructure, refers to money. So there should be really an efficient way to, to do the, or find that we can find the most efficient way to do the calculations and simulations. So in the last year, we worked on different levels of workflow enhancements, optimization, efficiency. One is on the logical level, really that users can use meta workflows and don't have to create every strap step from scratch. The other one was a system level. So we combined two workflow engines with different strengths. And the third solution I will talk about is about a prediction. So a model for optimization of tasks, because compared with computer scientists, well, people who are in the workflow area, yes, we, we often test the efficiency of workflows and we, we start different workflows several times. A researcher wants to have his her results once. They, they don't want to start a workflow 20 times to see what is the optimal um, usage of, of the computers or how many tasks, how many threads um, he should start. So it would be good to have a prediction model where, where you can see or directly assume or simulate what is the optimal usage and the fastest usage of the resources for a specific workflow. So the um, logical level was mid, um, for workflows we have done in the molecular simulation grid science gateway. So molecular simulation is a study uh, on molecular structures and we have different areas in the science gateway. And it's integrated with the underlying computer and data management infrastructure. We offer distributed workflow management and a data repository and also metadata management so that molecular structures and results can be found easily. The architecture has three layers. The user interface is based on WSP grade and LiveRay. So LiveRay is, is a portal framework. WSP grid has been developed by MTS Starkey in Hungary, in Budapest. And on, on the middle layer, you have the different components of the workflow engine with a workflow editor. There's a workflow storage, an application repository, an information system for the different um, stages of the, or the states of, of the workflow system. The workflow engine itself submitters submitters in um, in GUs, that is a layer on the, on the middle. Um, the submitters connect to different cloud and grid infrastructures. And of course, we have a logging so that um, we can always see on system level where a job was submitted, what is going on with the system. And below that, all that there's a DCI layer. You can connect with GUs to many more or many different systems and cloud systems, as I said, and grid system, also to de desktop grids. We chose in the project to use Unicore and as data management Extreme FS. And that is, this is one of, um, so quantum chemistry is applying quantum mechanics for two chemical systems. And that is one of the screenshots, how our job is set up. And then you have the monitoring, you, you have the output of the different energies, and we have all, always also a nice visualization of the result. This molecular structure doesn't look so impressive, but um, yeah, we have also nicer visualizations. So molecular dynamics is a study of physical movements of atoms. And here you can see them also a specific output for the Chromex energy. Chromex is a molecular dynamics um, software package. And the users have always a chance to, to upload their own files, to start a job, to monitor the job. 
and also for the third area, the docking area. So docking um, is concerned with finding the best binding mode of molecular structures with each other. So the result you can see here is a combined model of two molecular structures, how they bind to each other. So when I talked about, um, so I come now to the meta workflows. So, and um, our colleague in, in quantum chemistry, so she explained it with this slide, what her problem is, what kind of workflow she needs to solve. And, and she's uh, um, working in a wet lab. She does a little bit of computational work also, but that was her explanation. And I was like, okay, I'm not a chemist. You have to explain it a little bit different to me so that I can build and work on a workflow with you. And so that was on here, her translation into workflows. So she needs the correct structural description and um, evaluation, this um, suited functional sets and different steps to, to achieve that. So that, that was the next explanation, which still not helped me so much to, to find the right workflow for her. So that, and then we, we got better. <laughs> so we, we have to optimize the frequency. The calculation for the same molecule, and it starts with three atom, atomic workflows. So, and, and the workflow you can see on the left, on the right hand side. So there's the job creator, we have an experimental structure and um, we have this input and this opt wor optical workflow is one of the atomic workflows. It has already two, one step, the job creator is taken out of the job creator, but in, in the output file, when the quantum chemical code is running, the output file is already optimized. So there are some scripts around it. So and the next basic workflows are also, they have a job creator and it all, the different atomic workflows have different um, sense in, in the chemical sense for them, but it looks for me, of course, from the logic as a computer scientist first, oh yeah, that's easy. I, I, I can create these workflows for you, they are not complicated. But that helps them a lot. And um, if we created this really in the white box approach. So we defined sub workflows, we created templates, um, we made concrete workflows out of the templates and defined then meta workflows where they could use four different um, quantum chemistry simulations really these sub workflows. So they could reuse four different workflows and in the workflow editor of WSP grade, the workflow editor of GUS, um, you can see, for example, here only five boxes, but each of the boxes contains again a workflow. And that was much easier for the chemist to understand. And I, I asked her um, what she sees as advantages and disadvantages of, of workflows and what she likes. So these are not from me, that's from her. So she likes the high reusability of sub workflows that, that she can use it for her different um, simulations she's using. Also the high reusability of the final workflows because she can use them for all different kinds of inputs of structure she's working with and that she can combine them with each other. So that she can even combine also this workflow as one box again to, to the next meta workflow. What she also said was that, that she found first that it was very complex for her to understand the concept, that she had a long learning curve and that it's error prone in details. So if one of the workflows is or one of the steps is, is not um, or running into an error. It, it was first hard for her to, to find out what the problem is. And even so we have logging, it was really clear that we have to work also on the monitoring. 
and that uh, but the, the translation in meta workflow so she, she did some really a combination that is one of her, the last steps she did at the end and um to to make all her simulation for a specific research really working and th that was impressive she didn't use any help from us anymore and um she used all the sub workflows and the meta workflows to to start the job for, for the different structures and did it for four complexes. And uh, after the learner, steep learning curve, she said that she, that she likes her meta workflow. So she works a lot with the Moskvit Science Gateway now. So scaling up workflows, um, we worked on saving time and saving money. Um, we have a number of machines, so the normal situation is you have a number of machines available and you, you have a problem data set, especially in the, in the life sciences, the data sets are often really big, big data, as, as I also already said at the beginning. And you want to uh, split the data the best way that it's um, the best efficient also with a number of cores. And one of our solutions is using Galaxy. So Galaxy is really highly used also in our community at Notre Dame and in the US in general. You have a lot of different workflows um, for different communities there. And as I said, also the solution um, in Australia, the virtual genomics lab is, is using Galaxy. So it, it's a very well used um, science, not science, we are also, Galaxy is also the science gateway, but also a workflow editor and workflow engine. So it has only a little bit also of a problem. And that is, it cannot really, or it scales not very well up in the background. So the users mostly like the user interface. They like that they can use workflows like a toolbox, that they can put them together with drag and drop, that they can connect their steps and have so many workflows already available. So a simple workflow in Galaxy for one of our analysis was to use for data set in genomics. Uh, the BW8 um, software package. Then there's a SAM file um, created. That must be then um, changed to a BAM file to another mm -hmm. format, and then we use GATK. So that is for sequencing, um, for, for um, sequencing um, and alignments, sequence alignments. My God. So that is a simple workflow. It's not hard for the user to understand. They know what they're doing. So, but when, when the um, size of the data increases, so, so the time also increases, of course. So, so you want to use as many resources as possible for the workflow and the galaxy um, comes um, to, to some borders because the user has to create the parallel steps. So if, if a scientist really wants to use BWA and make five steps out of it in parallel, Galaxy is capable of doing that, but it's always a manual stop, step to do that. So the user must say, oh, I want to use for the step five, five times BWA and distribute it over resources. So our idea was then to say, okay, we, we create a workflow that is dynamically expanded behind Galaxy. This also that the user knows how many jobs are really running. He still sees this basic workflow, but in the background, it's, it's split it over different machines. It's split it um, on different resources. And he doesn't have to care or change his workflow at all. We used for this, um, and we created uh, a sandbox. So he uses Galaxy like he has always done. We create a sandbox for each task 
which runs to to have log files, to have a repository, to locate the file, to make the linking, the storing, and cleans up all the logging and log files. And in the sandbox itself, then the task runs as a workflow instead only as one one tool without that the user can see it. And we use for this Makeflow that is developed by the group of Doug Thane. And Makeflow has a logic a uh, little bit. It, Makeflow also, the name comes from Makefile. So it has a task structure. We have inputs and outputs. So the whole command line looks like, kind of like a Makefile. And it uses directly acyclic graphs. So it doesn't do loops. And it's programmatically generated. It's very easy to, to do that. So that, that was the idea that we can create from one job. We can split the data. We start the simulation in parallel on different resources, and then we collect the data again. And that's, that is how it looks from the logic. So the users, the users galaxy, macro is in the background. And then it's um, distributed via work queue. Work queue is also part, that are the worker nodes which are behind Makeflow, which are started. And work queue starts in local files and programs. And we can use local clusters. We have access to heat resources. We have a condor pool on campus. We have in the group, an SGE cluster, and at the CSE of the Center for Research Computing, also an SGE cluster. And we tested with all the different resources. So we could, behind Galaxy, start on all the different distributed resources. And um, then the job sent book was then responsible of the concept, really, to, to start a job. And um, the job sandbox did everything with temporary files, intermediate files, unused output, output that should go back. So that was all really put in a kind of sandbox. So that from each job, for each job we had a sandbox and then we have combined them in a joint step again. So the dynamic job expansion um, we, we tested this with work queue. We utilized 100 of course from a condor pool. We could clean up everything um, with the intermediate and um, logging files and used also the monitoring. And um, we had explored methods to transmit the needed environments such as executables and Java because, Java, because that, that's the other, of course, also challenge in that area because you have sometimes tools which which need um, Python, some some need Java environment. So you always have to get the whole environment with the sandbox to the different resources. And for this one workflow with different input data sets, we managed really to achieve a high speed up. And the users even don't have to get used to another system. They still use Galaxy. They only started the workflow with a different name without knowing that in the background there's a dynamic job expansion working. And for one example, we managed to have really the 61.5x speed up on the 32 gigabyte data set. So we thought that's a really pretty good result. So our, I've introduced it shortly also. So the situation is that scientists, they, they want to do their simulation, their workflows, and they do it once for one data set. Then they do it maybe for another data set, but when they have once their result, they, they don't want to run a job 100 times to find out what is the most efficient way to start them. They are only interested in the results. So we thought, it would be really good to, to have a predictive performance model for an application domain. And so that they only have to use this model once and have some an acceptable performance 
maybe even almost optimal when they use the parameters the first time. And we looked especially at the execution time and at memory usage, especially since um, often in, in big data or also in the life sciences, the memory usage is very important and yeah, brings often machines at the edge, at, at the borders. So we, we had a similar workflow to the one we, we had also with the dynamic job expansion. So it's also about sequence alignments using BWA. And we did know that we can split the data. Um, we, we also worked with the work queue master worker framework, which is related to make flow to, to the workflow engine I talked about. So we, we did some tests with BWA, Bautai2, and plus R. And um, these are all sequence alignments. And what, what we have done is to split the data. You can split the queries. Then you can start all the different jobs. And then you can join, have, have a joint step again. So, um, it, if there's interest, I, I can explain the different uh, formulas. Um, it's important to know is we, we looked at exactly these problems for the formula because, or for the prediction of sequence alignment because it's a specific group of problems. The, the problems are embarrassingly parallel. There's nothing embarrassing really about embarrassing Parallel, it's only to say that it's really natural parallel. So we, the reference size of the sequence and the query size influences very much the, the running time. So we looked at the number of threads and the number of tasks and how many tasks we would um, distribute. And then per task you have, can use on on the machines and a number of threads, the number of cores you are using there. Of course, we had to have a look at the disk speed and, and at the network bandwidth, because sometimes um, even if the machine is much faster, it, it might be such a low network bandwidth that it's much more efficient to, to use the machine that is nearer, but, but maybe not um, as efficient as, as the further away one. So, of course, we had to know what is the number of available machines because the machines normally, you have a user community, you have more users on them. What is, um, maybe there, there is an, only a, a certain number at that moment available, even so the whole clusters, as I said, at the CRC, for example, you have more than 25,000 cores, but not all the machines are always available. Um, what is the number of cores of the machine? So we had a look at these different parameters and um, had different data points. So we had a data collection with sequences. So we, we looked at, at the query size, at, at the sequence size, at, at the different cores, and had a training data set and a testing data set, and developed this regression model. <laughs> And uh, so we looked at the mean absolute percentage error and then we had different configurations for the different tools and uh, on application level and for time, for memory and on system level for time and for memory. So we, we varied a couple of parameters and to, to come the, to the formulas I showed before. And this was for a given data set, for example, the output. So we compared the number of tasks and the number of sets per task and the time they were using. And only to, to make it a, it, it looks nice, therefore I like this figure, but um, this makes it a little bit clearer. <laughs> so um, we always work with 360 um, at task per uh, the threads, threads. So 360 threads, and we um, put it once on 
on one core, then on two, then four, and then eight. And then we had the predicted time. And with, without our prediction model, we would have maybe guessed, oh, maybe it's best to use really eight cores per task and not only four. But um, our formula gave this out and our test really, really came to the end that, that the best result for this was to use four cores per task. So that, that was um, a very good result. Yeah, that, that was about the prediction model. I'm happy to take any question about all, all the content, of course. And I would like to advertise the works workshop at Supercomputing. So the deadline is in, at the end of this month. So if, if you would like to submit a paper, um, we would be happy to get, you know, submission. Um, we will have also in future generation computer systems a special issue on works so paper will be invited to have an extended version in the in the journal of, after the workshop and you might may, may know this person with the keynote speaker <laughs> so he will be there <laughs> and another, so i would like to acknowledge colleagues of mine many of them um, also gave me some slides. So for the logical level work, that is Richard Grunske, Sonja Harris Pavlis, Alexander Hoffmann, Jens Krüger, and the team from MTL Starkey and the University of Westminster. And for the system level and the prediction model, Nick Hasekamp, Olivia Chotari, Douglas Haynes, Scott Emmerich, and the Knowledge and Bioinformatics Lab, and the Cooperative Computing Lab at the University of Notre Dame. And I would still also like to, to mention that the Science Gateways Community Institute has, has been now officially started in, on August 1st. Um, the Science Gateways Community Institute is, is a focal point um, for the community, a central information point, support point for international collaboration also. So we offer really <laughs> also extended developer support for up to one year without charging. Um, we, we offer an open source extensible framework repository for gateway design integration and services. Uh, we have community engagement and exchange and the workforce development support. So the science gateway it's, uh, workflow editors are uh, specific. I, I, characterize something like that is specific science gateway for workflow enabled science gateway and um, I'm happy also to talk more about science gateways or define that more if you are interested um, and that was my talk thank you <laughs>